last time that happened. And last night I was kind of overshadowed by the architecture. Tonight I'm being overshadowed by the view, but I'll, 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 I'll do my best. I don't know if I... Do I need the microphone? Can you hear me? Yeah, please, the microphone. Okay. Use the microphone? Yeah. Okay. I will use the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and perhaps I could ask you to... But I fell asleep during my That was my problem. <laughs> This is not George Gordon Me. Uh, this is William Wheeler, who was in command of the 13th New York Independent Battery at Gettysburg. Um, on July 3rd, a a major general uh, whom Wheeler described as elderly and looking like a Yale professor rode up to him. Uh, he told Wheeler that he should go to the artillery, artillery reserve, which is very difficult to say sometimes, uh, and get ammunition. Now, Wheeler had already been there. He knew there was no more ammunition to be had. But there's something about this general's demeanor that told him he should not argue. So he merely saluted. Uh, rode off and hid behind some trees until the general left. <laughs> and that general, of course, was the next slide, please. Major General George Gordon Meade. Uh, at this point, he was in command of the Army of the Potomac for his sixth day, so it's not a surprise that Wheeler did not recognize him. Um, but um, he was not elderly. He was 47 years old. That's seven years younger than I am. Um, <laughs> Though I think he was worse for the wear than I am. So. so, so how did he get here? I mean, how did he get to command of the army just before Gettysburg? Many of you probably know the story. Um, it happened. Next slide, please. At this farm. This farm is called Arcadia, and it's just south of Fredericksburg. This is what it looks like today. Uh, I took this picture when I was researching the book. Um, on the on June 28th, uh, Meade was in command of the Fifth Corps of the Army of the Potomac. And he was camped on these grounds. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, a messenger arrived from Washington, D.C. Uh, it was uh, James Hardy. Uh, he had orders for me. He woke up the sleeping general and said uh, he had come to bring him trouble. <laughs> and Meade's first thought was that he was being placed under arrest. <laughs> he, he, the groggy general said, I, I have a clear conscience. Uh, Hardy explained exactly what that trouble was, which was he had orders that Meade was to take command of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, Meade protested. He said John Reynolds, uh, the commander of the First Corps, was the man who should have the job. Uh, Hardy told him he had no choice. He had to accept his orders. And Meade said, well, I've been tried and condemned without a hearing, so I suppose I must go to the execution. <laughs> um, so accompanied by his son, George, uh, and some aides, uh, and Hardy, Meade rode over to Joe Hooker's headquarters. Hooker, of course, was the uh, present commander of the Army of the Potomac. Um, rumors traveled pretty quickly in camp. Hooker knew something was afoot, so when, when Meade showed up in the, the pre-dawn hours, Hooker stepped out of his tent in his full dress uniform. Um, he and Meade entered their tent. Um, at this point, Meade really had no idea where the Army of the Potomac was. He knew where his corps was, but he didn't know about the rest of the Army. And, in fact, just a few year, days earlier, he had written to his wife. He said, I hear nothing whatever from headquarters, and am as much in the dark as to proposed plans here on the ground as you are in Philadelphia. This is what Joe Hooker thinks profound sagacity, keeping his core commanders who were to execute his plans in total ignorance of them until they had developed in the execution of orders. When, when me did find out, oh, yes, thank you, this... this this is, is the plaque on the grounds of what was called Prospect Hall. Um, it was erected, put up there in 1963 on the 100th anniversary of the battle. Uh, and it, it commemorates the fact that, that George Meade took command of the Army at this, at this spot. Um, when Hooker explained to Meade exactly the disposition of the Army, uh, Meade was so surprised at how scattered it was, he, quote, unguardedly expressed himself. <laughs> and, and if you know George Meade, uh, this was a habit that he 
uh, unfortunately indulged in him unguardedly expressing himself, and it caused him a great deal of trouble. Uh, Hooker retorted with feeling. <laughs> but eventually they must have ironed out their differences because eventually they emerged from their, their tent. Um, Captain George Meade, the general's son, um, uh, thought his, his father looked grave, but he, he thought he also noted a slight twinkle in his eye. The twinkle, quote, denoting the anticipation of surprise at the information to be imparted. And after a time, uh, the general finally did impart that information when he said, well, George, I am in command of the Army of the Potomac. And five days later, he had defeated Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, so, who was this man? The next slide. This is, this is George Gordon Meade as he looked at Cold Harbor in a, a somewhat famous uh, photograph. Um, I call my book Searching for George Gordon Meade, The Forgotten Victor of Gettysburg, because it seemed to me that the history books have somewhat overlooked Meade's contributions uh, to the war. And I'm not the only one. Uh, Francis Walker, who, who served under Hancock in the Second Corps, wrote in Battles and Leaders, he said, there is probably no other battle of which men are so prone to think and speak without a conscious reference to the commanding general of the victorious party as they are regarding Gettysburg. I think he's implying there that the, uh, the commanding general of the defeated party uh, is dis discussed a great deal, um, but the victorious party is not. And even Meade realized this. Within a year of the Battle of Gettysburg, um, after he was involved in various political battles back in Washington, he wrote to his wife, I suppose after a while it will be discovered I was not at Gettysburg at all. <laughs> I call him the Rodney Dangerfield of the Civil War because it seems to me he, he gets no respect. So I thought I got the idea to write this book when I read an article in Civil War Times magazine. It was about um, overlooked generals who did not get their coverage in the vast literature of the Civil War that perhaps they deserved. But after I had been working on this book for some months, I came across this article again, and I was astonished to read it and, and realize that Meade wasn't even mentioned in this article. He had literally been overlooked in an article about overlooked generals. <laughs> and it was, it was a reader of the magazine who wrote in, and, and the letter was printed in the next issue, and he pointed out that Meade hadn't had a major biography since 1960. And that's when the, the, the figurative light bulb went off over my head. I thought, you know, maybe I could write this book. I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm 30 miles from Gettysburg. Um, maybe I should tackle this. Now, but I didn't want to do a scholarly biography as much as I love a good scholarly biography. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to follow an example of uh, Confederates in the Attic. I don't know if any of you have, have read that book. And I love the way Tony Horowitz mixed the past and the present. And you can see the way the past reverberated even today. Um, and I also edited a magazine called Historic Traveler, which did the same thing. They, the writers went to historic places, explained what happened, and then pointed out what still remained that you can see today. So I thought I would, I would have this book reflect my own journey of discovery as I, as I told the story of Meade's life and visited the battlefields where he fought and the museums where maybe there's a Meade relic or two. I uh, talked to park rangers and curators uh, and, and even mead uh, enthusiasts. And so that's, that's what I pretty much did. Now, one place I could not visit, uh, next slide, please, was Meade's birthplace uh, because, quite frankly, I just couldn't afford it. Um, he was born in Spain. His father was a naval agent uh, for the United States government. Uh, his father, Richard, uh, loaned the Spanish government uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, it was the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. And when he asked to be uh, paid back, they ended up by throwing him in jail. <laughs> he never did get uh, reimbursed. In fact, he died in Washington lobbying the U.S. government to reimburse him for the money he had lost in Spain. Um, uh, the next slide, please. And this is just a close-up of the plaque. Uh, a a, a, a uh, literary society in, in Cadiz, Spain, put this on the, the house where he was born just this past January. Uh, so he's remembered in Spain, perhaps perhaps not so much here in the United States. Um, now, one, one result of this loss of fortune was uh, the advantages of a free education became readily apparent. So Meade went to West Point Military Academy, and he graduated in 1835. 
So I went there, I'm figuring I would see all the, uh, the, the buildings named after me, and the archways <laughs> named after me, and the statues of me, uh, and naturally I found none of those things. Um, I did find a diorama of Robert E. Lee greeting George Pickett after the repulse of Pickett's charge on July 3rd, uh, but there were no dioramas of me winning uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. I did find this structure. Now, this was in the uh, cemetery. It is the second most grandiose uh, tomb at uh, West Point, and it's to Daniel Butterfield, who did not even go to West Point. He had to get special, special dispensation from the Secretary of War to be buried there. And of course, um, Daniel Butterfield was no friend of George Meade's. Um, as John Batchelder, the Gettysburg historian, said, uh, Butterfield has never lost the occasion to stab General Meade's reputation under the fifth rib. Um, uh, the next slide, please. My Marco Rubio moment here. <laughs> and this, of course, this of course is Daniel Butterfield. He did write taps, um, so we'll, we'll give him credit for that. But he is one of those people who, who uh, did not like George Meade and worked to uh, subvert him. Um, now, after Gettysburg, Meade did some. Uh, he left the army for a time, and then he returned, did surveying work. Um, he did some surveying work in Florida. The next slide, please. And he actually does have a town named after him in Florida. He surveyed this site, and he picked the site, and they named it Fort B. Uh, and this sign amuses me because it is one of the few occasions where General Meade gets more credit than he deserves. It says he later became commanding general of the Union forces during the Civil War, which is, as we all know, not quite true. General Grant became uh, commanding general of the Union forces during the Civil War. However, right next to this sign, I found this memorial. This is to Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> now, Jackson did serve before me, but the only thing he did there is he got in a, an ugly and embarrassing dispute with his commanding officer, William French. He accused French of dallying with a servant girl and wanted to bring up charges against him. It became an embarrassment to the army and to both men. Um, William French, of course, went on to become the commander of the Third Corps briefly under Meade. Um, and, you know, Jackson probably had a reason to accuse him of this. Um, but nonetheless, that's all he did at Fort Meade. Yet he gets this beautiful monument, and, and Meade gets a, a monument with a factual error in it. Um, next slide, sir. Now, of course, like many generals, Meade fought in the Mexican American War. And I decided I would retrace at least some of his footsteps um, after this conflict. And I went down to Brownsville, Texas. Um, Meade got his baptism of fire at two bat battles right outside today's Brownsville, uh, uh, Palo Alto and Reseca de la Palma. Uh, and I went down on the weekend of uh, uh, close to the anniversary of the Palo Alto battle. And I was delighted to find some Mexican-American war reenactors, which you do not see all that often. Um, <laughs> and it was also very uh, interesting to see, next slide please, this is the site of Fort Brown. And Fort Brown was the fort that was built um, during this conflict, Meade was there uh, when he was serving under Zachary Taylor. Uh, this is the driving range, because there's a golf course on Fort Brown now. And this cannon is embedded in the golf course, you can see I believe that's some of the embankments from the fort behind it. Um, Interestingly, this golf course is between the border fence and the Rio Grande, so it's kind of in a no-man zone, uh, which kind of explains this next slide. <laughs> and the club. I did play around at golf in the blistering heat, uh, and I did not hit any golf balls in New Mexico. I probably couldn't have hit it even if I had tried. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, it was interesting to golf on the site of, of this, this famous fort. Um, I also went to Port Isabel, Texas, which is a, a golf course uh, town that was a major port of supply for the Union forces. And all the generals who fought in the war, the future generals, passed through Port Isabel. Um, and so I went to the little history museum there, and I found, uh, found this sign. You're, you're really good at this, by the way. <laughs> Um, 
it starts out well. It says George Gordon Meade, you know, went on to become one of the most important generals of the Union during the American Civil War, and I think we can all agree on that. Vicksburg, Virginia. You now he led troops in the second assault on Vicksburg, Virginia, and was placed in command of Vicksburg by General T. Sherman after the city fell. I think someone wrote this after a dream or something. We know that uh, he wasn't in Vicksburg, whether it was in Virginia or Mississippi, because he was fighting the Battle of Gettysburg at the time. Uh, I found this to be very amusing. They probably got it off of Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> ah. They probably did. Um, and then, next slide, please. And one thing Port Isabel has is a thing they call the Walk of the Generals, and they have these medallions in the sidewalks um, commemorating all the generals who passed through. Um, and I couldn't make this up. I mean, they had a map to find all the generals, and I went to find the Mead medallion, and it wasn't where the map said it was. I literally had to search for me that afternoon until I finally found him uh, far away from, from where he was supposed to be. So that was his pre-war stuff. Of course, we're interested in me because he fought in the Civil War. Um, he, he fought in most of the major battles of the Eastern Theater. He didn't fight at the first bull run, so he was still trying to get a commission at that point. Uh, before I did that, though, I wanted to get a sense, if I could, of... of what Civil War battles would have been like, so I went to Winchester, Virginia, and attended a skirmish of the North-South Skirmish Association. <laughs> uh, any members? There, there were some members last night in Milwaukee. Which, um, these are people who have shooting matches with Civil War-era weapons, uh, including cannons, and um, in Civil War-era clothing. Uh, the next slide, please. Except this is not the North-South Skirmish Association. This is one of the lighthouses meet, built in New Jersey. Uh, at Barnegat Bay. He did build lighthouses before the Civil War. And I was very pleased to see that at this particular lighthouse he is uh, remembered, probably because it's not that far from, from New Jersey. Uh, the next slide, please. And now we're at the North South Skirmish Association. This is one of the cannon crew. In fact, this is the winning cannon crew. Um, it is commanded by the former mayor of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who has told me he had pretty much every weapon, an example of every weapon used by the United States throughout its entire history. He also has an entire warehouse full of his cannon. He has 30 some odd cannon. <laughs> and in some secret location in, in Lancaster. Um, and it was just an amazing thing to see. You can see the targets in the background. And they shot through the bullseye every shot. They were just extraordinary. Dude, they had a little mallet that they would do. Very minute adjustments to the to the alignment just to get it perfect, and it, they succeeded every time. And it was an amazing thing to see in here uh, when they're shooting like the carbines, hundreds of people along the line shooting simultaneously. And it does sound pretty much what you think a Civil War battle would sound like. Uh, um, fortunately, they're all shooting in the other direction, which makes it <laughs> a lot more fun uh, and a lot less tragic. So Meade did fight. Um, most of the major battles. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, he he was he was part of McClellan's Peninsula campaign. Um, uh, he, he his his brigade was in reserve at Beaver Dam Creek. It was very heavily engaged at Gaines Mills. Uh, it it uh, then participated in McClellan's uh, start, sorry change of base uh, to Harris's <laughs> Landing. <laughs> And along the way, uh, on the change of base, he fought a battle called Frazier's Farm or Charles City Crossroads or Glendale, and he was badly wounded. Um, he was he was hit twice. Once it uh, it went through his uh, by his hip and out his back, and another one hit him in the arm. Uh, he was very upset for a time because he thought he would have been shot in the back, and which is just dishonorable. Um, and he was pleased to find out, in fact, that he had been shot in the front which I guess is the silver lining to that, uh, <laughs> that particular cloud. Uh, Frazier's Farm, this land has been saved by the Civil War Trust, and I think eventually it'll be open to the public. It was, it was private when I was there, but someplace in those woods, which were cleared land uh, in 1862, is where, where Meade was wounded. Um, the next slide, please. And... Um, he went back to Philadelphia to recuperate, and with by the next month, he was back with his, his men, his brigade, 
um, for the uh, second battle of Bull Run, or second Manassas, if you prefer. So I went to visit that battlefield, and I went there on a day of driving, driving rain. I was literally the only person on the battlefield, and obvious, for obvious reasons. And as I was tromping, tromping along near Bronner's farm, um, I came across bones. And I, I, you know, I had read that it, sometimes you do find Civil War remains. There was a soldier from New York found in Antietam in 1998, I think. Another soldier was found in the railroad cut at Gettysburg um, within the last 20 years, I think. And, you know, maybe they're animal bones. I don't know. I'm not a forensic scientist, but um, I thought it was worth reporting, so I went back to the ranger station at the Bronner Farmhouse. Uh, I, I mentioned that I found three separate pockets of bones. And uh, he looked at the volunteer and said, uh, you know, what are we doing? These something like this. I think we, I think we called the coroner. Uh, so they picked up the phone. They made a call someplace, left a message, and that was the last I heard of it. I left my car. <laughs> said, "I'm here all weekend. Give me a call. I'll take someone out if you want to see where the bones are. They're just down the path." <laughs> I called when I got back to Harrisburg. Did, did anyone check that out? I was a little curious to see what the story was, uh, but I never heard anything back. So I'm going to have to keep you in suspense on this. <laughs> but anyway. I, and I put my baseball cap down to, for the scale. Um, uh, next slide, please. Of course, I visited Antietam. Um, as you know from the quiz, uh, Joe Hooker was wounded at Antietam. I think he was shot in the foot. Um, and, it, and Meade uh, took command of the First Corps, um, even though uh, James Ricketts outranked him. In fact, Meade actually rode over to Ricketts, who was related to him by marriage somehow. I think he had married, uh, his sister had married someone. Anyway, there was a marriage relationship there. And he tried to turn over the command to Ricketts, and uh, McClellan actually sent a note to me saying, no, it's, I want you to take command of the First Corps, which he did, and he was much gratified uh, to do that. This is one of the tours I took, and one of, the, one of our ranger guides is demonstrating that, in fact, yes, you can ford Antietam Creek um, if you want to. It's, of course, a lot more difficult when you have Georgians up on the bank over there shooting at you. Um, but it's not, it's not terribly deep there. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I, I did go to Fredericksburg. I visited the, the place where Meade fought. He fought south of the town at a place called the Slaughter Pen, which the Civil War Trust has recently uh, uh, preserved. Um, he broke the Confederate lines at the slaughter pen. He broke Stonewall Jackson's lines. Uh, did not receive the support that he needed to, to hold that position. Uh, there's a story that he sent to David Burney um, requesting support. Um, Burney did not send any. And, of course, Burney said as soon as he got the message, he sent uh, reinforcements. Um, Meade, yeah. I heard a chuckle. <laughs> Meade rode over in, 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 as one observer said, in lang language strong enough to almost make the stones creep, um, chewed Bernie out, uh, and, and therefore, by unguardedly expressing himself, uh, made yet another enemy. But Bernie, in a letter I found uh, at the uh, Army Heritage Center in Carlisle, wrote to a friend and said, uh, Meade asked for reinforcements, and I said, not, not one gun will leave my my division, and uh, the Pennsylvania Reserve is going to be damned, uh, which I think is fairly damning uh, evidence. Um, and then I went to Chancellorsville, of course. Uh, oops. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Just uh, imagine that picture, that, that headstone, which is actually an arm stone. That's, that's where Stonewall's, Stonewall Jackson's arm is supposedly buried, and if you go to Chancellorsville, you got to... You have to visit Stonewall's arm. Uh, of course, that was another Union defeat. Uh, Meade had advocated that Joe Hooker, after the bad uh, flank attack that had routed the 11th Corps, that Hooker attack the next day. Um, Hooker, in fact, decided he would retreat. And he later told Meade that it was Meade's counsel that, that uh, convinced, helped convince him to retreat. Uh, Meade was aghast by that. Uh, he said that please explain that. And Hooker said, well, as I recall, you said something like, since it's impossible to retreat anyway, we may as well attack. Well, I knew perfectly well it was possible to retreat. Therefore, I interpreted that to mean that we should retreat. Uh, 
the, the, once again, Meade unguardedly expressed himself uh, in, in such strong terms that Alexander Webb, who was his chief of staff at the time, left the tent because he did not want to be a witness to language that would lead to Meade's court-martial. <laughs> so now you can maybe understand why Meade thought he was going to be arrested when Colonel James Hardy mm -hmm. showed up uh, on, outside Frederick on June 28th. And of course, I spent a lot of time at, uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, I take it probably most of you have, have been to Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. If you want to learn anything about the monuments at Gettysburg, there are like three copies of the Monuments Guide left, so <laughs> I just have to put in a little pitch there. This, of course, is the statue of Meade uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, to a, a, an outside observer who knew nothing about the Civil War, looking at the Meade statue here on, on Cemetery Ridge, as it gazes across at the Lee statue on the Virginia Monument, State Monument, um, I think a neutral observer would think that Lee won the battle, because uh, you know, Meade's monument is, is, is here, and, and Lee's monument is up here. But as, as we all know, uh, Meade was the victorious uh, general at Gettysburg. Um, while I was there, I did some interesting things. On uh, Remembrance Day in November, uh, they have volunteers read uh, the names of soldiers who were buried in the National Cemetery at a, a very uh, emotional moonlight ceremony. Uh, the cemetery is lit by candles, and it's, 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 it's quite an event. If you're in there, Gettysburg in November, I encourage you to try to, to, to be there for that. Um, I was able to get into the Leicester House, which is a little white farmhouse that uh, Meade uses as headquarters. Uh, it's usually closed, but uh, they let me go in. And that's where he had the famous Council of War on, on July 2nd. Um, and of course, I explored the battlefield as much as I could. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the battle, which I'm sure some of you know much more than I do. Um, but here's a quick summation. Uh, here's Oliver O. Howard on Cemetery uh, East Cemetery Hill. Um, he was the commander of the 11th Corps. Um, he is a. There's there's much debate about Howard these days. Um, like me, he went to Bowdoin College. He's from Maine. Unlike me, he lost an arm in the war. Um, the one thing he, he did do that you can really give him great credit for is he left a division on Cemetery Hill in case. The Union needed a fallback position, which, of course, they did on July 1st. They did fall back to this great position on Cemetery Hill. And when Congress voted thanks to the generals for uh, the victory at Gettysburg, uh, it's interesting, the first general they thanked in their resolution was Joe Hooker. Uh, Meade did come in second, but Howard uh, came in third, um, which, which says something about the value of his contributions. Uh, on the second day, uh, oh, next slide, please. I don't know if anyone knows who this is. Warren? Warren. 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 On Little Round Top. Um, of course, he was sent uh, to, to Round Top by Meade. Um, uh, it was unoccupied because Dan Sickles had moved the Third Corps forward. Um, and he rushed, had reinforcements rushed up to Little Round Top. And, and now this very famous statue of Warren is up there today. And it's, it, I think it's probably the most photographed statue at Gettysburg because it is incredibly photogenic. Um, next slide, please. And here's another view from Round Top. You can see the 16th Michigan Monument in the foreground. That's Devil's Den in the background. Uh, that is with the stone that the Meade plaque at, uh, in Frederick showing the change of command was taken from, from Devil's Den. And then, next slide, please. And then, of course, in the third day's battle, um, uh, Pickett's charge, the, the repulse at the bloody angle, uh, the climax of the battle. This is um, the 72nd Pennsylvania Monument. It, it is an interesting story behind behind this. Um, they wanted to place their monument near the stone wall. Uh, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Commission said no. Um, other regiments said the 72nd never actually got there until the fighting was over. A charge which the 72nd Pennsylvania vigorously uh, denied. It went all the way to the state Supreme Court, um, and the state Supreme Court sided with, with the regiment, and they, they <coughs> put their, their monument there. At one point, they, I believe they bought land in front of the stone wall, and they said, if you don't let us put our monument here, we're going to put it in front of everyone else, uh, which might have helped change their minds, too. Uh, next slide, please. 
So after Gettysburg, I don't want to go into the whole debate about um, did, did Meade pursue Lee at the Battle of Gettysburg, because he did. Um, he did not destroy Lee's army like Lincoln wanted him to. Lincoln actually sat down and wrote a letter saying how disappointed he was, but uh, decided not to send it. Though he did let uh, Henry Halleck express his dissatisfaction for him. Uh, and then there were there were battles um, um, through the rest of the, the campaign, the Bristow, Battle of Bristow Station, the Battle of Rappahannock Station, both uh, victories for, for the Union. Um, but of course, in the spring of 1864, this man became uh, General in Chief of the Armies, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And this is one reason why I think Meade's name doesn't come up so often, because Grant traveled with the Army of the Potomac and um, overshadowed Meade. He kind of eclipsed Meade. And you always hear discussions of Grant versus Lee. You don't hear discussions of Meade versus Lee. Even though, it's, as you know from the quiz, uh, Grant was very much taken with Meade. When he showed up to meet uh, Meade, they hadn't met since the Mexican-American War. Meade had heard that Grant wanted to replace him, uh, perhaps with Baldy Smith. Um, and he offered. He said, if you want to put your own person in, I will step aside. I understand perfectly. Uh, and Grant was very impressed by this, and uh, so he impressed me even more than his victory at Gettysburg. And of course, he kept him in command uh, of the army until the army was dissolved after the war was over. Um, but this, the uh, next slide, please. This is kind of what uh, happened to Meade's reputation as a result. Uh, this is a, a marker at, at the Wilderness Battlefield. Meade is the forgotten commander. Um, in, the, in Grant's uh, presence with the Army is, is part of that, uh, that problem. So I did explore the Overland Campaign. It's, uh, if you haven't had a chance to do that, um, you know, the Wilderness in Spotsylvania, North Anna, Cold Harbor, um, there's just uh, tons of sites to see in Virginia. Um, all of them worth a visit. And eventually I did get down to Petersburg. Next slide, please. Where I met with uh, Dr. Christopher Stowe, who is a Meade expert, has been working on a, a scholarly biography of Meade for 17 years now. Um, he took me uh, to find this obscure monument that shows where Meade's headquarters were. Ironically, they are on the grounds of Fort Lee. <laughs> just uh, it just uh, irony abounds in the story of, of George Gordon Meade. And it's off in the woods and, and no one knows about this anymore. Um, and then after Petersburg, I, I followed the trail of the Army Potomac all the way to, to Appomattox. Uh, the next slide, please. And I even got to witness the surrender ceremony. Now, um, Meade wasn't present for the actual surrender ceremony. He was with his army, and Lee's army stood between him and, and, and William McLean's um, house. This ceremony took place when the, uh, the grand opening of the uh, Museum of the Confederacy Satellite Museum in Appomattox a few years ago which is a very interesting event. Um, it was being picketed by um, the Virginia Flaggers, and this is an organization that uh, advocates the, the, the display of the Confederate flag. Uh, they had been upset because uh, the Museum of the Confederacy was gonna, not going to fly the Confederate flag in front of the museum. They were going to fly the American flag, and then flags of all the states that succeeded from the Union. Um, so this outraged the Virginia Flaggers, they picketed the event, and they also hired an airplane to fly around and buzz the opening ceremonies, which are held outside in front of the museum, towing a banner that said "Reunification by Bayonet," and drowning out the speakers. Um, <laughs> and then they had had a, uh, a little reenactment of the surrender ceremony at Appomattox. Uh, and I guess that's as close as I'm going to come to the real thing. So. Uh, this uh, next slide, please. I, this is an image I, I think is just amazing. This is the war is over, uh, and Meade is uh, able to enjoy the grand review of the armies in Washington, D.C. Gary Edelman discovered this. I can't take credit for finding it. It's, uh, if you look at the image, it's just a long distance view of the grandstand that was set up in front of the White House. But if you zoom in on the image, uh, you get to see this, this band of luminaries. You've got you know, Grant, of course on the left, peering, looking at the parade. There's a blurred figure next to Grant. You can barely see him. He's kind of go He's ghosted. But that's Edwin Stanton. And then you got, Vice, you got President Johnson, who put in President after Lincoln died. Next to him is Wesley Merritt, 
who was in command, he was commanding the cavalry at the Grand Review. Sheridan was not present, Philip Sheridan. And of course, the Sheridan Meade relationship is a, a topic that would be a discussion all in itself. Uh, Charles Wainwright, who kept great journals, uh, thought that Sheridan made a point of not being present because he didn't want to appear subordinate to Meade at this event. So Wesley Merritt uh, commanded the, the cavalry. And when the, a corps was passing by the grandstand, that corps commander would sit next to the president. So once the cavalry passed by, then Merritt would leave and the next command would show up. And then, of course, we have George Gordon Meade. He's wearing his, the, the glasses that gave him the nickname of the old goggle-eyed snapping turtle. Um, and as far as I know, this is the only photograph in which Meade and Grant appear together. I've never come across another one. Um, in front and next to me, it kind of blurred, is Gideon Wells. And then next to him is William Dennison, who was the postmaster general at that point that gave him a front row seat. Talking to him is uh, William T. Sherman. Now, the big story of the day was would Sherman shake Edwin Stanton's hand? Stanton had publicly rebuked uh, Sherman for the surrender terms he gave, gave Joe Johnson. Sherman was livid. And in fact, he, he refused to shake Stanton's hand when he entered the grandstand. And then next to Stan is Montgomery Meigs, the quartermaster general. So it's an amazing picture. And if you, if you look at the whole thing and zoom in on various sections, you can find other notables. Winfield Scott Hancock is standing all the way to the, to the left beneath the banner that says Gettysburg. Um, Beats uh, Grant staff are sitting together. Uh, there are some Victorian ladies in mourning. Uh, they must be widows, I would presume, in, in a group. And it's an amazing picture. Um, so, this is the end of the war for me. The Army of the Potomac was dissolved on June 28th, uh, 1865, two years to the day uh, when he took command. Uh, a lot of people think that Grant, fought, that, that Grant replaced me as head of the Army of the Potomac. We, we know, of course, that's not true. Uh, he was in command of the Army longer than all three of his predecessors combined. Um, so, did I, did I find George Gordon Meade? Well, sort of. I did find you know, a number of reasons why I think he, he, his reputation has been somewhat eclipsed. And I, I, I can't absolve him of blame. I mean, he had a, a terrible temper, and it, it made him enemies. And we, we talked about David Burney. As Charles Wainwright once said, he said, Me, me does not mean to be ugly, but he cannot control his infernal temper. Uh, his his aide Theodore Lyman called him the Great Peppery, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and that bad temper also led to a, a poisonous relationship with the press. Um, he had a, a reporter named Edward uh, Cropsey, or Crapsey, I prefer Crapsey, <laughs> run out of the army because uh, Crapsey had reported that he had intended to retreat after, Getty, at, after the wilderness, and only Grant's intervention had prevented that from happening. So uh, Crapsey was run out, drummed out of the army, was riding backwards on a mule with a sign around his neck that said "Libeler of the Press," <laughs> and, which is it's a terrible media strategy. So I think if, if someone did something like that today, people might enjoy it. Uh, so the newspaper reporters traveling with the army decided they would not mention Meade in their dispatches anymore, unless it was in connection with the defeat. Um, and they would elevate Grant instead, which is what they did for, for some, some months. Um, politics was, was a factor. Meade was associated with George McClellan, uh, who um, the radical Republicans in Congress detested. And of course, McClellan ended up running for president against Abraham Lincoln. Um, Meade was tainted by this connection, and he was also helped along by, next slide, please, this gentleman. Uh, Daniel Sickles. Yeah, we did mention Sickles uh, advancing his third corps without orders at Gettysburg um, into an indefensible and too long position. Third corps being decimated at the battle. Uh, Sickles, of course, uh, lost his leg. Um, and not only did I visit Stonewall Jackson's arm, I visited Dan Sickles' leg, <laughs> you know, which is at uh, I, apparently a new Army Medical Museum uh, since I saw it there. Um, and I've been, I also visited a, a horse's head, and we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but Sickles, in order to bolster his case that he wasn't acting rashly or, or with poor judgment, um, started to, telling people that he had actually won the victory for the Union because had he not advanced his corps and precipitated the fighting, 
Meade was going to retreat from Gettysburg, which is not true. Uh, but as I was saying earlier about only the good die young, um, Dan Sickles lived the ripe old age of 90, and they don't even know exactly, because a lot of things with Dan Sickles are a little foggy. <laughs> uh, but he lived to a ripe old age, and, and, and that was the story he told until he died. Now, one thing we can give uh, Sickles credit for is, in a sense, if he didn't save the battle, he did save the battlefield, because as a congressman, he introduced a legislation that made uh, Gettysburg a national military park. And, uh, and one thing you have to say about Dan Sickles is he is an interesting guy. <laughs> um, now, one thing you can say, also say about Sickles is he never got a statue at Gettysburg or in Washington. Next slide, please. And Meade got both. We saw his statue at Gettysburg. Uh, this is a statue of, of George Gordon Meade that you can find in Washington, D.C. Um, it was in storage for a long time, but they, they finally got it. I was also the last Union general uh, to get a statue, a statue in Washington. Uh, there was a lot of infighting and, and bureaucratic nonsense that delayed it until, I think, 1927. Mm. And another reason I think uh, Meade doesn't get the credit he deserves, next slide, please, is that, that these guys um, get a lot of credit. We, we hear a lot about Jackson and, and Lee and, and Jeb Stewart and, and um, the romance of, of the Confederacy, when, in fact, um, you know, Meade defeated Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg. Uh, and the Union did win the war, last that I heard. <laughs> but uh, Lee had, you could have to fill an entire bookcase with just books about Lee, but uh, there's almost nothing out there about Meade. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what if Meade had crushed Lee's army like Lincoln had wanted him to after Gettysburg? Well, I think uh, he would certainly not be the forgotten victor of Gettysburg. Um, he would be. Uh, perhaps the ex-president we talked about, but um, but we'll never know. Uh, but Meade does have his supporters, um, and, and the most fun of, of work in this book was uh, joining the General Meade Society of, of Philadelphia. Uh, in fact, the very first event uh, I attended, I went with my wife to Philadelphia uh, for the grand unveiling of Old Baldy's head. Now, we, the Old Baldy showed up in the quiz tonight, too. It was Meade's horse. Old Baldy was wounded several times. Uh, Meade finally sent him home before the uh, Overland campaign, and, and, and Old Baldy ended up outliving uh, his master. And when he did die, some patriotic Union veterans dug him up and cut off his head, yes. uh, and they put it in a museum in Philadelphia. And, uh, and for years, it was on this this curious old museum on Pine Street. Uh, next slide, please. Oh. And there's Old Baldy. Yes. Uh, when that museum on Pine Street closed, uh, another museum, the Grand Army of the Republic Museum and Library in Philadelphia, had to sue to get possession of Old Baldy. Um, it, they said it had originally belonged to their collections. They had loaned it to the Pine Street Museum, uh, and they sued successfully to get it back. So we went to the museum for the grand unveiling. They built a brand new case for him, um, and... Uh, and he was finally getting, I guess, the, the, the respect he deserved. Um, so I got to meet the, the Mead Society um, at that event. Uh, and the, the best thing of all, the next slide, please. Uh, well, there's my old Baldy pen. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a great thing. And then the next slide, please. And my wife got her picture in the Philadelphia Inquirer with old Baldy. And so that was, uh, that was quite a thrill. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and the Meade Society does all kinds of things to keep alive the memory of George Meade. Uh, this was a rededication of a statue to Meade that's in Philadelphia. Um, and these are members of the society. The man in the top hat and the bow tie is Andy Wosky. He's the founder and the president. Uh, as he pointed out, when this statue was originally dedicated, Meade was dead, so he could not show up as General Meade at this event. So he showed up as the mayor of Philadelphia. <laughs> And they're trying to get this statue moved downtown Philadelphia, where, where more people could see it. It's in a somewhat obscure uh, spot now. And uh, one fabulous thing they do every year is they have a birthday commemoration at George Meade's gravesite. Uh, the next slide, please. And it's on December 31st, which is New Year's Eve. Um, Meade was born and married on December 31st. Uh, that's Meade's gravestone in the center. 
it, uh, the event attracts many living historians and apparently a Statue of Liberty. It's <laughs> <laughs> like tax services. Yeah. 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 Death and taxes, right? I could use that. Um, and they have a champagne toast at the gravesite, um, and they have a buffet lunch back at the cemetery gatehouse. They have tours of the ceremony at the cemetery. And of course, this year will be Mead's bicentennial. He was born in 1815. So the birthday event promises to be the biggest one ever. So if you're going to be in Philadelphia on New Year's Eve and you want to hang around a cemetery, <laughs> this is the best place to do it. I hope there's no snow on the ground. Well, <laughs> the, the, the size of the crowd depends on the weather. If it's bitterly cold, only the hardcores are on. But uh, um, everyone should go. You can also see uh, the gravesite of Rocky Balboa's wife, who actually never existed. <laughs> <laughs> but they have her tombstone after filming the last Rocky movie. Sylvester Stallone uh, gave it to Laurel Hill Cemetery. So, so, so they have it there now. So George Meade isn't cool. enough. Uh, there's a rocky connection. Uh, and then uh, next slide, please. And then they they have a a, a volley over over the gravesite at the conclusion of the ceremony. Uh, and uh, the next slide, please. Anyone recognize this guy? George Gordon Meade. This is the last known picture of Meade. Uh, he died at the. How old did you say he was in this picture? His seventies. He was fifty-six. Fifty-six years old. This was taken in eighteen seventy-two. Um, at this point, uh, his, his his reputation was 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 already being eclipsed. Um, his after his death, his his son took on the task of editing his life and letters, and then his son died. His grandson took up the task and finished it. Uh, it was finally published in 1913, which is 50 years after the Battle of Gettysburg. And by then, Meade had gone a long way to slipping into obscurity. As a Philadelphia reviewer wrote when he reviewed Life and Letters, he said, For 50 years, Meade has been set aside, ignored, depreciated, even insulted. Uh, he, and then he says, Lee, in whose hand the South placed and kept its sword of command, will shine forth as a central figure of the strife. His audacities, his endurance, his resourcefulness and his indomitable battle spirit were longer tried and more triumphant than those of any other leader. But in Meade, though the latter had no such range of opportunity, no such unfettered command, we believe that Lee met his match. They were the two best soldiers of the war, and it was a, it was a fate propitious to the Republic which set them opposed in the battle that saved the Union. And so... Um, I think we can thank George Gordon Meade uh, for that great victory, and I'd like to think that maybe he's no longer uh, as forgotten as, as he was just a few years ago. Um, thank you very much. If anyone has a question, I will, I will <coughs> endeavor to answer it. Yes? What was the uh, cause of death uh, is it back at the sixth one? He died of pneumonia, and I'm sure it was related to the bullet wounds he had received in 1862. He had had some recurrent attacks of pneumonia um, after that. Um, but being shot does tend to age a man, I think. Why did he elect to stay, you know, serve under Grant for the whole over the campaign? I mean, I know they disagreed on a lot of things during the campaign, and even, you know, expressed it, at least in the beginning, that maybe he didn't. Well, it was, it was his duty. Um, Meade was a, an old, a gentleman of the old school, and he did su seek to, to do his duty honorably. Uh, and, and Meade was his, his superior officer. Uh, he did complain to his wife that, um, I think he said something like, now you will see you know, laurels being placed upon another's brow, you know, meaning Grant. Um, but... Overall, if you read his letters, um, he didn't mind serving under Grant so much. In fact, um, when he read a newspaper account saying essentially, you know, the army is, uh, the, the, the campaign is being run by Grant, but uh, commanded by Grant, but run by me, he said essentially that's correct. 
And I think they had a pretty decent relationship for most of the war. Uh, the one burr that got under Meade's saddle was Philip Sheridan. Uh, Meade uh, favored Sheridan, he liked Sheridan. Uh, he promoted Sheridan ahead of Meade, gave uh, uh, Sheridan command of the Shenandoah, when at one point he had promised it to Meade. Um, that irritated me. And he did get a little um, irritated by Grant's sledgehammer attacks, like at Cold Harbor. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, I think they had a fairly decent command relationship. I don't think it was rancorous uh, at all. Um, and of course, it lasted throughout the war. One, what was Old Baldy's role at first full run if Meade was not there because he said he was wounded at? He was owned by David Hunter at that point. And then uh, Hunter put him back uh, into the quartermaster, gave him back to the quartermaster corps, and then Meade picked him out. And then he was Meade's horse from that point on. Did you go up to Dul Duluth? Dul Superior in your. I did not. Oh, of course, his, his Great Lakes service? Yeah. I did not, no. Because okay. there is a marker up there. Is there? Yeah. Well, that, was, that was in the second edition of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Does Meade have any descendants living today, and have you met them? He does. He has, um, I believe, many descendants. I think there's a branch of the Meade family in Maine. In fact, they sold all their, their family relics, and Andy Wosky of the Meade Society curated the auction. Um, I met um, uh, Major Chuck Meade, who lives in Texas. Uh, he had come up for the, the birthday commemoration at Laurel Hill. Uh, Meade's mother had never had a tombstone. So he, he paid to have a, a tombstone of, for Mead's mother, and uh, at the ceremony uh, two or three years ago, they actually placed that stone. So he, there are Meads everywhere. I mean, it was a big family. Um, so they're, they're out there. Uh, Matthew Fox, who played uh, uh, Jack on the TV show Lost, he apparently is a direct Mead descendant. Do you know why Mead was not at Appomattox? Well, Meade was with his army. Um, I don't think it was considered any kind of a, a, an insult. I, I just think uh, it was practically, it made no sense for Grant to send, you know, a flag of truce through Leeds' entire, entire army to the other side uh, to get Meade and fetch him back to attend the ceremony. I've never come across Meade ever complaining about that. It would have certainly have been, been nice. In fact, at the, at the bookstore today, I thought I saw a print, a, a lithograph in the back that showed Meade at the surrender ceremony. Yeah, a little dramatic <laughs> license there. But he, he was with the Second Corps. Um, he was waiting to attack. He literally uh, was told there were, you know, a two-hour truce, and he had his pocket watch out. And the story is that two hours passed, he snapped his shot, he told Andrew Humphreys, prepare to attack. And then another flag of truce came through saying, and surrendered. Anyone else? Where, where uh, is that uh, statue located in Philadelphia? Uh, the statue? Oh, I'm sorry, in D.C. In D.C., it's it's near Judiciary Square. Um, it's what's it's. I think that's a courthouse behind it. And it used to be over on the other side of the Capitol, uh, almost literally in the shadow of the Grant Monument, which is uh, <laughs> appropriate, I guess. And then when they built an underpass there, I think in the 60s, they, they put it in storage for, for several oh. decades. Why don't they move it to Fort? Well, I, I, I mean, they should keep it in Washington, you know? Even though me did not like Washington, uh, for obvious reasons, they, he was treated pretty badly there. But uh, I think it belongs to the nation's account. You obviously, from your lecture, enjoyed very much the uh, exercise you went through getting to try and find me. What was, it, what, what happened to you, or what's the biggest thing that happened to you, or that writing the book? Well, I learned a lot about the Civil War. I'll tell you, um, that was the, the biggest journey of discovery, um, and and I, I started to develop a passion for it, where I had an interest. Um, now I'm, I'm spending more money than I should on Civil War books and <laughs> <laughs> dragging my wife to Civil War reenactments um, and that kind of thing. And no, yeah, no one can sympathize there, I'm sure. Um, 
so I'm, I'm just now I'm now it's a it's 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 a fascination where it was an interest. I think that's the biggest change in me. Where did all the Pine Street uh, material go? Did they all go to that new museum? Well, that was a good museum. A lot of it's in Gettysburg. Okay. In fact, when I, I wanted to get in and see, they had me sword. Uh, his frock coat from Gettysburg, which they originally put on display at the Gettysburg Visitor Center for a, a limited time for the the anniversary commemorations. But they said, no, it's in storage, we're not letting anyone see it, uh, you're out of luck. Uh, so that's where most of it is, and, and what they're going to do with it, I don't know. There were plans to open up a whole new museum in the, uh, the Second Bank of the United States building in Philadelphia, and... I, I'm not sure why, probably finding problems that ended up getting scuttled. Uh, so most of it is in storage right now, I think. Did you do as I did when you saw old Baldy walk around to the room behind it? I'm not so easily. Oh, really? Is it named after George Yes. There's a whole bunch of streets on the street. Oh, yeah. Don't want to be there. No. I'm sorry. And there is a there was a George Mead school in Gettysburg, and there's a George Mead school in Philadelphia. And every year, the Mead Society raises money for a scholarship for a student at the George Mead School in Philadelphia. And of course, Fort Mead. I didn't hear the question on that. That I should put Fort Mead, uh, Mead Avenue in Chicago in, in the next edition of the book. Yeah. Or give me an excuse to come back to Chicago. So, Anyone else? Going once, going twice? Well, thank you very much.